Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Team Lund, and in this video, we're going to talk about how can you balance aging and having muscle mass. So this is what uh, David Sinclair calls uh, pulsing, if you've heard about uh, before. Make sure you click a like and subscribe as well for future videos about optimizing your health and performance. Do it! Before we get into the particular topic, then we'll play a clip from Huberman Labs podcast uh, where Sinclair talks about uh, this idea of pulsing. So uh, yeah, let's just hear it. So my view of longevity, the way I treat my body is um, I don't burn both candles. I have one end of the candle lit. I, I'm very careful. I don't blow on it. Um, but I also do enough exercise that I'm building up my muscle, but I'm, I'm not huge. Anyone who's seen me you know, knows that I'm not a, a professional bodybuilder. But I try to actually, here's the key, and I haven't said this publicly that I can remember. I pulse things so that I get periods of fasting and then I eat, then I take a supplement, then I fast, then I exercise, and I'm, I'm taking the supplements and eating in the right timing to allow me to build up muscle sometimes. Because you can't just expect to take something constantly and do something constantly for it to work. And that's that's why it's taken me about 15 years to develop my protocol. All right, here's my proof as well. I do, I think, know what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, I have taken the DNA age test as well, based on the DNA methylation age uh, that looks at your biological age. And uh, when I took it, I was 25 years old. That was two years ago. And my biological age was 16. My chronological age, age was 25. And I do <clears throat> basically attribute to that to my protocol, my health protocol, <laughs> the diet I follow, and other things that I do. So I do think uh, that uh, it is what I do, and it's not something that, you know, this is my current physique, I weigh about 85, 84 kilograms, I'm not like, yeah, like a massive bodybuilder, I'm pretty strong, I'm stronger than 95% uh, of people, I have more muscle than 95% of people, uh, but... Uh, you know, it's not that I maintain this muscle uh, with my, you know, let's say, prior uh, practices of, you know, there's regular standard bodybuilding meals or whatever. Uh, this is actually that I've built with the same protocol that I follow today uh, with a very confined eating window and time restricted eating window. Uh, so let's say age 19, when I was in the military, I was eating, you know, three meals a day, 68 kilos. And this now 26, 27 years old, I've eaten one meal a day for five years uh, and I've still managed to build this physique. Uh, so I do think that, you know, my biological age is very, you know, appropriate for health and longevity. It's smaller than my actual chronological age, but at the same time, I'm also, you know, I can show that I have, you know, good muscle mass and uh, strength. So I'm not like withering away from the chronic uh, calorie restriction. And it does go back to, you know, calorie restriction, you know, that uh, this is the idea behind basically imposing some sort of nutritional stress on yourself and we know that this kind of hormesis uh, through calorie restriction is one of the few known ways of extending lifespan in uh, many species. And uh, monkeys, mice, uh, fruit flies, they all have this similar pathway, uh, similar, similar results, and humans probably do so as well. There are many reasons why calorie restriction uh, works, like it blocks inflammation, it uh, promotes mitochondrial biogenesis, it uh, reduces insulin and IGF-1 levels that uh, then suppress mTOR, uh, it activates autophagy, that is kind of the cellular recycling, removal of uh, old material. It increases antioxidant defenses, glutathione and SOD. It increases sirtuins, uh, increases AMPK that promotes sirtuins and uh, promotes DNA repair. Uh, so yeah, color restriction works because of these reasons. Uh, there's also the evidence that, you know, autophagy, the process of cellular clearance, is uh, associated with human longevity and human anti-aging. So uh, centenarians, they have uh, basically enhanced autophagy lysosomal function and uh, serial mLs of the autophagy biomarker Beclin-1 are associated with increased health in centenarians. Um, but on the other hand, where it comes to be, let's say, the idea of balancing your longevity with muscle mass and protein consumption, then it goes uh, back to, let's say, yeah, animal protein and mTOR. So there are studies that find that animal protein consumption is associated with a uh, bigger all-cause mortality, uh, whereas with plant proteins, uh, it's uh, reduced all-cause mortality. And there are many reasons for that. You know, obviously, plant proteins are generally lower in calories, uh, whereas animal proteins tend to be higher. And if people do eat animal protein more, then they may also be eating like a hamburger with McDonald's, or uh, they may be eating like bacon with cheddar, but just because of the high calorie intake. Uh, that will accelerate aging. Bacon. And in animal protein, there's also this amino acid called methionine that we know is also associated with accelerated aging and uh, even like malignancies and cancers. So the reason why for that is because methionine stimulates this complex called, called mTOR. Uh, obviously, leucine that uh, the clip, the video clip also talked about, does the same. It promotes muscle growth. But mTOR can also have like these negative, other negative side effects, like it does accelerate immuno immunosenescence, accelerates aging, uh, and may also increase malignancies in the body. But it does promote muscle growth as well. So mTOR is clearly good in some sense, uh, but it can also be harmful in excess. 
but muscle mass itself is also very beneficial for aging. So uh, muscle strength and muscle mass are uh, associated with longevity and reduced mortality. So people who have more muscle and strength, they generally uh, are healthier. So obviously mTOR is needed in some sense. You don't want to be deficient in mTOR. If you're low mTOR all the time, then you're going to get frailty and sarcopenia. So there are studies that find that yeah, low muscle mass, low muscle strength, a much smaller percentage of survival compared to appropriate muscle mass and strength. This probably doesn't apply to like bodybuilders and excessive muscle mass, etc. But appropriate muscle mass, you know, who knows what it actually like entails, <laughs> how much is too much and how much is adequate. We don't really know, but you definitely want to be under muscle. You don't want to be frail. You don't want to be sarcopenic and uh, skinny fat, basically. Did you scrum the little bastard? mTOR is stimulated by uh, both leucine or amino acids and methionine, for example, as well as insulin and IGF-1. So clearly, you know, restricting protein isn't the only avenue of uh, restricting mTOR activation. So you can also restrict mTOR by restricting your carbohydrate intake, for example, and uh, not spiking your insulin several times a day. Uh, so if you look at, you know, the hierarchy of needs for your body, then amino acids and protein are much more important for longevity and survival than carbs, for example. So the kind of easiest way to do is to not become like diabetic and um, not eat overly too many carbohydrates um, when it comes to mTOR stimulation. How much protein is needed to stimulate mTOR? Then for that, you know, any kind of amount of, um, so even like small amount of protein, 10 grams, one gram of leucine, for example, that you can get from basically any food, even that will turn on mTOR. Like um, there's no getting around it. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you eat 60 grams of protein or 10 grams of protein, you will turn on mTOR to a certain degree. And uh, the threshold where you achieve maximum protein synthesis per meal appears to be around 30 to 40 grams of protein per meal. And even if you eat 60 or 100 grams, then you're not going to turn on mTOR more. Um, so as long as you're eating uh, 30 grams of protein at least in one meal, then you are already capping out in the amount of mTOR you're turning on in that particular moment. So for example, yeah, you imagine you eat even like 10 grams of protein for breakfast, it's like cereal and uh, a little bit of milk, you're getting 10 grams of protein or something, and uh, you're still turning on mTOR and IGF-1 and in insulin levels, and you're snacking all the time, you're spiking mTOR, etc. This is much worse for your aging from the mTOR aging theory of uh, pr pr perspective of that uh, compared to eating even more amounts of protein, but you're doing it in a smaller time frame because, uh, like I said, there's a threshold how much you can spike the mTOR in one meal. And even if you eat 100 grams of protein in two meals, but you're eating 100 grams of protein in six meals, then the two meals is still healthier for you because of the time restricted eating aspect. Uh, so you're spiking the mTOR two times versus six times, for example. So yeah, like I said, even 10 grams of protein will spike the mTOR. Uh, so just yeah, eating six times a day, even if it's low protein, that's that's much worse for your aging than the two meals. And uh, the higher protein intake will inevitably also be still superior to muscle growth and uh, muscle maintenance. Like I've eaten one meal a day well, technically two meals or one and a half meals, <laughs> that's another story that could, you can check on my other videos. But yeah, I eat only two times a day with protein and I'm still being able to build muscle and my biological age is uh, reduced. <clears throat> and uh, despite eating like a very high protein intake, I'm not eating like a low protein diet, I'm eating plenty of uh, protein. And despite that, my biological age is still, you know, nine years younger than it actually um, chronologically is. Awesome. I love protein. When it comes to protein intake, then obviously the most important thing for protein uh, and mTOR management and the methionine management uh, can be still just innovative fasting. Even if you spike your mTOR with high protein intake twice a day, then it's not nearly as bad as six times a day. And uh, on top of that, the ratios between methionine and glycine also matter. So uh, studies find, animal studies find that glycine supplementation can actually mimic methionine restriction. So uh, uh, animals or rats that are fed more glycine, 8% uh, glycine diet, uh, they actually live 4 to 6% longer. In other studies, glycine supplementation can actually make uh, animals live 30% longer. Uh, so yeah, glycine is this kind of counterbalancing of methionine. So it uh, reduces methionine toxicity and and has like other benefits. It boosts glutathione and uh, lowers insulin levels or lowers blood sugar levels, for example. And uh, that's why I do think that uh, a high methionine diet basically a high muscle meat diet, a high diet with a lot of animal protein, muscle meat, uh, that will be bad for aging because of uh, methionine and that we know in a lot of studies actually find that. Whereas with glycine, 
uh, the glycine is yeah balancing that and how much methionine and how much glycine it's hard to tell uh, for every gram of methionine you do consume uh, your glycine demand tends to increase by 0.5 to 1 gram uh, so i you know personally just do think that um, your 50% of your protein can come from uh, methionine because methionine is still essential amino acid uh, you need it for uh, methylation you need it for detoxification and uh, basically growth, uh, but you don't want to get 100% of your protein from methionine. You don't want to get 100% of your protein from muscle meat or uh, eggs and fish. And uh, the other 50% of your daily protein should come from, let's say, glycine-rich uh, proteins or collagen-rich proteins, uh, such as these, you know, tendons and ligaments, bones, uh, beans are just, and uh, plant proteins are low in methionine. They don't have a particularly high amount of glycine, but they're just low in methionine while still giving you protein. Whereas, like, you know, uh, drumsticks and so that they just have more glycine and collagen compared to methionine uh, but i do think that a glycine supplement is also mm, let's say beneficial because of that same reason so it balances the methionine and uh, kind of makes up for some of the uh, lack of uh, glycine in uh, a lot of people's diets so the um, minimal healthy dose i think for daily consumption is like five grams of glycine i personally take like 10 grams because i think it's great <laughs> it's a great supplement um uh, but yeah, like even doses of 90 grams a day have been found to be perfectly safe and no adverse effects. So anywhere from 5 to 10 grams is enough to take a glycine uh, supplement. And getting uh, 50% of a protein from, let's say, more of these collagen and uh, glycine-rich uh, sources and 50% from uh, regular methionine uh, sources. How much protein in total should you eat? Uh, well, the research is also pretty clear in terms of muscle hypertrophy that uh, muscle growth tends to peak around one gram per pound of body weight, even 0.8 grams is adequate to uh, basically reach the threshold or reach the maximum threshold for uh, muscle growth. If you eat more than that, then you're not gonna build more muscle. So you don't need to be eating more protein than 0.8 grams per pound of lean body weight. Uh, one gram per pound is also like a just good estimate to aim for, it's easy. Um, yeah, but you eating less than that, like eating 0 0.3 or 0 0.4, that will eventually lead to like, these are these low protein diets, like longevity diets, low protein, people get, you know, hip fractures and they get low thyroid from that. <laughs> so I don't think that it's kind of a good balance. The RDA of protein is also pretty low, 0 0.4, 0.45. For maintenance, I think the bare minimum uh, protein intake could be like 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 grams per pound. Uh, but if you want to still build muscle, then 0 0.8 and one gram per pound is, is uh, really good. I think it's gonna be very beneficial for just the health span and making sure that you don't yeah like get weak bones and get osteoarthritis <laughs> later in your life uh, if you eat more than that 1.5 2 grams per pound then you're not going to build more muscle but you do minimize some of the fat gain so protein is still beneficial for like you know burning calories and you can achieve a calorie deficit if you're eating like a high protein diet uh, more easily uh, compared to other let's say ratios and uh, even then, like their studies also find that calorie restriction still trumps protein restriction. Uh, it's better to be in calorie restriction than to restrict, restrict protein. And you still live long, the animals still live longer if they're in uh, calorie restriction despite not being in protein restriction. So, yeah, don't get obese, <laughs> basically. Uh, the optimal BMI, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about this that the optimal BMI where the lowest mortality is found in studies is uh, 22 to 25. So, Obesity is bad, over being overweight is bad, increases your mortality, increases just um, disease risk. But if you're underweight, then that can also be harmful. And a lot of the times the underweight people, they're also like substance abusers or they have some sort of other mental disorders that uh, are also you know, harmful for longevity. Uh, if you're a healthy person with good mental health, then I don't think that it's particularly harmful for your uh, longevity if you are at a BMI of 20, for example, uh, but you still want to have like some muscle and be somewhere between 22 to 25 BMI. If you have 26 BMI, for example, like I do, uh, I think I'm 26, somewhere around there, um, then that's probably because of you have like muscle. So it's even then it's not particularly at accurate. Um, like uh, you can have some muscle, even if you have a little bit of muscle mass, then your BMI is gonna be slightly, you know, it's considered, you, you're gonna be considered overweight just because you have muscle, but it's not, inherently harmful for your longevity because you have it's 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 not fat mass it's muscle mass uh, but obviously being at a bmi of 30 is probably too much even if it's pure muscle if you have bmi of 30 and it's pure muscle <laughs> then that's just going to impose a lot of stress on your organs and you're gonna you know age faster because of that so yeah uh, maybe somewhere between 22 
27 is the kind of 28 at the max is the yeah, optimal BMI to be at. You crazy son of a bitch. If you want to learn more about these topics, then yeah, you can check out my book, Metabolic Autophagy, that talks like specifically exactly 100% of these topics, um, like the eating frequency, mTOR, AMPK, autophagy, sirtuins, what, all those things. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.